Finances are a deeply personal topic. Whether you've been blessed with abundance or are struggling to make ends meet, or you land somewhere in between. Does Scripture give us any direction on our attitude toward giving? That's our subject today on Truth For Life, as Alistair Begg continues a message titled Spiritual Investing. He's teaching from Philippians 4, verses 14 through 23. Their giving was not, if you like, convivial. It was essential. That, incidentally, is the kind of sharing about which the Bible speaks in relationship to God's people. Isn't that something of what Jesus means when he says, if you love those who love you, what reward is there in that? Or to paraphrase it, if I invite people over to my home who like to invite me over to their home, what's the big deal? The real challenge is whether you or I are prepared to invite to our homes those who have no prospect of reciprocating by dint of their circumstances. Or even if they do, are so largely different from us on the outside that the world looks on and says, I don't know why those people are over with those people. Now, while it is true that every fellowship will largely represent the demographics of the environment in which it finds itself, I acknowledge that, but I refuse to accept that as the totality of what it means to enter into partnership. And I am exercised and concerned and increasingly consumed with the notion that the surrounding community can explain it away in the way that it can explain away any other secular gathering of people who have similar educations, similar financial resources, similar interests, and similar backgrounds. And so they come around and they say, well, of course, you don't need God or Christ or the Holy Spirit for anything that's going on here. We understand it perfectly. You're all sort of the same. And we have baptized cultural elements into our Christian professions to the extent that we do not cross boundaries, we do not build bridges across boundaries, both in terms of race and in terms of finance and in terms of education. We have baptized a cultural milieu into our expressions of Christian faith. And that is one of the reasons that the world looks on and has such difficulty in understanding why it is that we think they should be beating our doors down to come out and find what the explanation is. There is no need for explanation. If you hang with those who like to hang with you, what reward do you have? Do not even pagans do that. Of course they do. You say, well, what does this mean? I don't know what it means, but I just wanted to mention it in passing. (laughs) I don't have to have all the answers. All I'm saying is, if you had moved amongst the Philippian believers, this stuff has got to mean something. There's neither barbarian, slave, Jew, Gentile, bond, free, whatever else it is. Let's take another one. My Jewish, uh, Messianic Jewish brethren. Are you telling me now that we're supposed to have messianic churches so that that is distinct from the barbarians and the Scythians and the Gentiles? Absolutely not. That was what Acts 15 was all about. They wanted to go back and say, unless you are circumcised in the way the Jews determine, you cannot be a true believer. And Paul and Peter go head to head on the issue. And Paul says, Peter, you're flat out wrong on this, and you shouldn't give up on this. And if you do give up on this, it will have a major effect on the future of the church. Therefore, I resist you to your faith. You cannot baptize this cultural factor into the essentials of Christianity. Not if your sharing is going to be on the basis of the radical difference that Jesus makes. All of that to say this. When partnership, 
when fellowship is galvanized in an understanding of the grace of God in Christ, then at least to some degree, loved ones, there must be the indications amongst us of the difference that Jesus makes. And that, it seems to me, demands that we as individuals and as families cross bridges ourselves in order that as individuals we may understand, embrace, be involved in a kind of fellowship that is not only cross-cultural and cross-racial and cross-everything else, but is radically driven by the kind of partnership to which Paul is referring here. Now, I don't know where in the world any of that came from. I don't have it written down in front of me, but you can do with it what you will. It is one thing to identify that someone has a need. It's another thing to display a genuine interest in the need. And it's quite another thing to get involved in the need. For example, what about the Good Samaritan? Remember the Good Samaritan? Certain men went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his raiment and departed, who stripped him of his raiment and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. And in the King James Version it says, and by chance a priest happened to be going down that way. Or in the NIV, a priest happened to be passing down the road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. He saw the man, he identified the man had a problem. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. So he identified he had a problem. He identified the fact that he was half dead. And the fact was he was about to become whole dead because all he did was identify the problem. He explained he had some kind of interest in it. It would seem that the second chap in the story Jesus told perhaps went over and had a, had a closer look. Oh, man, you've got a problem here. Woo! 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 Okay, right. Uh, let's uh, be warm, be fed, be cool. Thank you. But a certain Samaritan... See, is he like this Samaritan? See what Jesus is doing? He says, you homogeneous boys, you that want to keep it all in the same group, all the same background, all the same stuff. He says, let me tell you who was the one that got him on the donkey, a Samaritan. Do the Jews like Samaritans? No. Why would you make a Samaritan the hero of the story? To make the point. But a certain Samaritan, because remember the question was, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But a certain Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him, and he went to him, and he bandaged up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and he put him on his own donkey, and he brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. You see the, see the difference between identifying the need, showing an interest in the need, and becoming involved in the need? It wasn't that the churches in Macedonia didn't understand the need that was represented in the apostles' life. It wasn't that the people from Thessalonica were totally disinterested. They just never got involved. They never crossed the Rubicon from information to application in much the same way that is possible for us to do. And that's what made their partnership outstanding and long-standing. Now, loved ones, what is it this is a question that's been in my mind this week. What is it that takes God's people and makes them generous? Makes us sacrificial? What is it? Is it an emotional surge? Is it external manipulation? No, it's neither of those things. It is the awareness of the fact that we have been given to freely. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 10 and in verse 8, in sending out the um, disciples, he says to them a very interesting little sentence in Mark, Matthew 10 and verse 8. He says, Freely you have received, freely give. So, in other words, the foundation of sacrificial, generous, resourceful partnership is the grace of God. 
It is when I suddenly understand that all that I am and all that I have, all that I've been able to generate by means of resources, all of my gifts, all of my talents, whatever they might be, all of that I have been freely given. So when somebody then says, will you freely give? There is only one sensible response. Yes, I must. Not because you've manipulated me. Not because you've tried to play a violin and make me emotional and weep and get my checkbook out and write to you. Not because you have appealed to how I'm going to feel when I get my name on the building. No, because you just said, hey, has God freely given to you? Yes. Would you consider freely giving? Now, it is in the awareness of the fact that we're involved in a partnership that is most helpful here. We do not all have the same gifts. We do not all have the same capacities. God has purposefully put us together in that way so that each of us might offer up what we have. You find that all through the New Testament, for example, in Romans uh, chapter 12. Just as each one of us is a body with many members, and the same members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. That's partnership. We've got different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Now, all of these aspects and more besides represent the kind of partnership that is involved. And each partner contributes something different to the other. And when we understand that, then we understand the importance of team and that there is no I in team. That is, Singer Ferguson put it, the Philippians would never become jealous of Paul's status or his gifts. Nor would Paul complain that he alone bore the burden of Christian ministry. Because each gave their gifts. So we ought not somehow or another to get stymied on this matter of money as we so regularly do. Either to make out that somehow or another money is the crucial thing, it makes the world go round or makes the church go forward. And so to exalt it to a place of unbelievable influence... Or, on the other hand, so to denigrate it is to say it doesn't matter at all. In relationship to Paul's concerns, it was their generosity that put his head on the pillow. It was their generosity that gave him clothes to wear. It was their partnership that marked them out as radically different. Now, I've spent an awful long time on the first point, but let me go to verse 17. What about Paul's perspective in this? Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. Now, here's a novel approach, isn't it? Their generosity made Paul glad, not because of what their gifts meant to him, but on account of what their gifts would mean to them. You've got to think about this for just a moment. Here comes the apostle, and he writes this letter, and he says, I'm so thankful that you gave to me. The natural response would be to say, see, I told you we should send him that coat. I bet he loved his coat. I'm so glad that we sent him those two extra things of pancakes. I bet they kept him going for a good few breakfasts, and so on. Paul says, he didn't even mention the gifts. He didn't say, well, I was thank you for so much, or thank you for what it was, or thank you for his usefulness. He doesn't say anything of that. He says, I'm so glad that you gave to me, not because you gave to me, but because of what it meant to you. You get this? This is weird. This is a whole different form of accounting. It isn't the value of the gift I'm keen on, paraphrases it, um, Phillips, it isn't the value of the gift I'm keen on. It's the reward that will come to you because of the gifts that you have made. Why? Because in giving in this way, the Philippians were investing in eternity. They were investing in eternity. 
They were able to anticipate rich dividends in much the same way that accumulating interest stands to the credit of one who makes deposits in the bank. If you buy CDs or you buy annuities, you understand that you make the investment now and you receive the benefit later. Paul says, I'm so excited that you were so generous because you have made an investment now and you will receive the benefit later. He doesn't talk about the benefit that comes to him. Luke chapter 6, the words of Jesus, verse 38. Luke 6, 38. Give, and it will be given to you. Give, and it will be given to you. See, you never... The only way to goof up in sharing is not to share. Because you never know this principle unless you do the first part. It's never given to you unless you give. So if you don't give, there's no, there's no second half. That's why some of us don't know the second half. We think, I can't afford to give. Listen, we can't afford not to give. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And Luke chapter 18, verse 29. In verse 28, Peter says to Jesus, We have left all we had to follow you. Now, I don't know what his spirit was in saying that, but it's classic Peter, you know. Hey, we are the guys. Jesus said, let me tell you the truth. No one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. In other words, when you take all that represents security to you, when you take all that represents familiarity to you, and you are prepared on whatever level, in whatever context, to offer that up to God, to say, now, God, I'm going to do without my home or my wife or my brother, my parents, my children, and I'm doing this for the sake of the kingdom of God. Jesus says, you will receive a hundred times more in this present age, and in the age to come, you will receive eternal life. Now, the reason that this is so difficult is the same reason that insurance guys have in selling policies to people when they're young, because it's all about dying. And it's hard to believe you're going to die. When the guy comes around to your house and says, now, uh, how about your little son? I said, yeah, look at the size of him. Wouldn't you like to buy an insurance policy for him? What? A life insurance policy? No. Why not? He's going to die one day. Oh, thanks for coming in and mentioning that. That's a wonderful thought. But they're, their best motives are there because they're trying to get you to see beyond the horizon. And it's so hard to do. It's so right to do and so good to do, but so hard to do. The same is true when the Bible confronts us with an individual eternal account. Oh, eternity. Eternity is not today. I'm going to lunch. Eternity is not tomorrow. I'm going to the office. Eternity is now time soon. I'm going to school. Eternity is one breath away for every one of us. I'm so thankful, says Paul, that your partner's with me in this way. And he says, I want you to know that what really jazzes me is not the benefit I receive from your gifts, but is the benefit you will receive from your gifts. Because in relationship to three score years and ten, eternity... It's going to last forever. Give, and it will be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. We'll come back later on, and we'll talk about the distinction between generosity and sacrifice. We'll talk about whether it is sufficient simply to reallocate resources from the government to the church and congratulate ourselves because we've decided to apportion them to the church rather than to the government. And we'll ask the question whether that can be equated with what Paul is talking about here in Philippians chapter 4. Probably be a little uncomfortable for all of us. It's getting to be routine, isn't it? Spiritual Investing 
That's our subject today on Truth For Life. Alistair Begg will close in prayer in just a minute, so be sure to keep listening. As Alistair described, investing in eternal matters requires sacrifice in the present moment. It sometimes means being content with less, choosing to give up certain privileges or pleasures for the sake of contributing to something greater, building God's kingdom. But our world bombards us with the message that we need more in order to be truly happy. We need more money or more possessions, more experiences. In this materialistic, consumeristic culture, how do we experience contentment that leads to joyful generosity? Well, that's the subject of a 31-day devotional our team is recommending today. It's simply titled Contentment. And as you spend a few minutes each day reflecting on God's Word through this devotional, you'll be able to focus your heart on Christ rather than on your present possessions or circumstances. We'd love to send you a copy of the Contentment Devotional, along with our thanks, when you donate today to support this nonprofit ministry. Truth For Life is entirely funded by generous listeners like you. And your donation is truly a gift to your fellow listeners. In fact, it's an investment that has eternal value. Just think of how many people will grow in their knowledge of Scripture through Truth For Life because of your giving. And how many people will hear the gospel for the very first time. To invest in sharing God's Word, you can easily go online to donate to request the book Contentment at truthforlife.org slash donate or you can call us at 888-588-7884. The website is truthforlife.org slash donate. Our number is 888-588-7884. And if you'd rather mail your donation, you can do that easily. Our address is Truth For Life, P.O. Box 39 Cleveland, Ohio, 44139. While you're on our website, be sure to sign up for the Truth For Life Daily Devotional as well. It's hard to spend a silent moment with God in prayer each day because of how busy we are, but this daily devotional is an easy way for you to start your day in God's Word. When you request the daily devotional, we'll send it to you each morning. It'll be right there in your email inbox. You can easily view it on your phone or your tablet. Visit truthforlife.org and scroll to the bottom of our homepage to sign up for your free subscription. Now to close with prayer, here's Alistair. Father, we thank you this morning for your love and your goodness to us. Thank you that you are the great giver, that you have given sacrificially, that you have given your only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that is actually where some of us need to begin, because we have never understood the immensity of your gift, and we have never come to take it from your hand in humble, repentant, childlike trust. Others of us, Lord, are frightened to believe that we can't live if we don't really give. Help us then to think these issues through without the coercion of a man, without the manipulation of a structure, without any dependence upon emotionalism, but with our Bibles open on our laps and a spirit of prayerful expectation. Teach us, we pray. May grace and mercy and peace from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be our abiding portion today and forevermore. Amen. I'm Bob Lapine, inviting you to join us Tuesday as Alistair continues presenting the Bible's countercultural perspective on wealth. The Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life. where the learning is for living.